Messages are communicated around the body using the nervous system and this involves electrical impulses transmitted by neurons to effectors as learned in a previous unit. However, there is a different method of communicating messages around the body and this involves the endocrine system. Here, hormones, which are chemical messengers, are secreted by endocrine glands. The hormones are then transported by blood to the target organ where they cause a change in the target organ. The nervous system is a faster and shorter response in terms of its effect. The reason why the endocrine system takes more time is because of the fact that the hormones are transported by blood to the target organ and this takes time. However, the effect of the hormone is longer lasting. So here's an example of using those keywords. When you want to control your blood glucose level, after eating, the amount of uh, glucose in the blood increases. So your body has to send messages to decrease the blood glucose concentration. And this is done by the endocrine gland, the pancreas, which detects the high glucose concentration in the blood and secretes a hormone called insulin. And the insulin transports by the blood to its target organ, which is the liver. And then it causes changes in the liver where the liver starts to store the glucose by converting it into glycogen and this decreases the blood glucose concentration. The different endocrine glands produce different hormones. So these are the endocrine glands and hormones that you have to understand. The hypothalamus secretes TRH Pituitary gland secretes TSH, ADH, FSH and LH. Thyroid gland secretes thyroxine. The pancreas secretes both insulin and glucagon. The adrenal gland secretes adrenaline. The ovaries secretes estrogen and progesterone. And the testes secrete testosterone. When writing an exam question, you should make sure that when you're answering the effect of these hormones, you talk about the fact that an increase in the hormone causes effect. So instead of say, saying something like testosterone causes puberty, you should say an increase in testosterone concentration uh, leads to puberty. So always talk about an increase in the concentration when you're talking about the hormone in terms of its effect. And don't just state the effect of the hormone. So these are all the hormones that you need to know in terms of the endocrine gland, their target organ and their effect which will be talked about in uh, topics in the next few minutes. So we've got thyroxine which is produced by the thyroid gland. The target organ are the heart muscle cells and it increases metabolic rate which includes the rate of respiration and it also increases heart rate. TRH is produced by the hypothalamus, the target organ is the pituitary gland and it stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more TSH. TSH is secreted by the pituitary gland, the target organ is the thyroid gland and it stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxine. Adrenaline is produced by the adrenal gland it's got lots of different target organs. So it's got heart muscle cells, blood vessels and liver. And it causes different effects. So it increases the heart rate, blood pressure and blood flow to muscles. It also increases blood glucose concentration by stimulating the liver to break down stored glycogen to glucose. FSH is secreted by adrenal gland and has an effect on the egg follicle in the ovaries. And it causes the mature egg follicle and this also stimulates estrogen production. 
Estrogen is secreted by follicles and ovaries. It targets the uterus lining and the pituitary gland. It causes the thickening of the lining of the uterus. It also stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more LH. LH is secreted by adrenal gland. It has an effect in the egg follicles and ovaries. It causes ovulation, which is the release of an egg from an ovary. It also stimulates follicles to develop into corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone. The progesterone is produced by the corpus luteum ovaries and its target organ is the uterus lining or the pituitary gland and it maintains the thickness of the uterus lining. It also inhibits FSH and LH. Insulin is produced by the pancreas and its target organ is the liver and also muscle cells. It decreases blood glucose concentration by stimulating the liver to convert excess glucose into glycogen and then this glycogen is stored in the liver. Glucagon is also secreted by the pancreas. It has the same uh, target organ liver and its effect is it increases the blood glucose concentration by stimulating the liver to break down stored glycogen into glucose. And then finally ADH is secreted by the pituitary gland. Its target organ is the collecting duct of kidney nephron and it makes the collecting duct more permeable to water so that more water is reabsorbed back into the blood. So these are all the hormones and information to know for the upcoming topics that I'm going to talk about. So metabolic rate is the rate of chemical reactions and this includes the rate of respiration. And you can increase the metabolic rate by using hormone thyroxine which is secreted by the thyroid gland. An increase in thyroxine causes the heart muscle cells to contract more rapidly and strongly and it also increases the rate of respiration in body cells. Explain how thyroxine controls metabolic rate is an example of negative feedback. Negative feedback is a corrective mechanism where the level of substance going above or below the normal level triggers a response to bring the level back to normal. For instance, if there's an increase in thyroxine concentration, it triggers changes that decrease the amount of thyroxine so that it brings it back to uh, a normal level. And then as there's a decrease in thyroxine concentration, that triggers changes that increase the amount of thyroxine back to a normal level. So if the concentration of thyroxine increase or decreases, that causes a change and that change then decreases or increases the thyroxine concentration back to a normal level. And that's what negative feedback is. So which three endocrine glands and hormones are involved in negative feedback corrective mechanism of thyroxine? So as we stated earlier, we know that the hypothalamus secretes TRH. That TRH then has an effect on the pituitary gland which secretes TSH and that hormone targets the thyroid gland which secretes thyroxine. So here are the three glands, we've got hypothalamus, pituitary gland and thyroid gland. If there's a higher than normal thyroxine concentration, that means there's going to be an increase in the metabolic rate and the heart rate. And the higher than normal thyroxine concentration triggers a change which inhibits the hypothalamus in its secretion of TRH. And because less TRH is produced, that stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete less TSH. So the pituitary gland is inhibited and less TSH is produced. And this less TSH produced, that inhibits the production of thyroxine by the thyroid gland and because it inhibits the production of thyroxine the thyroxine concentration will decrease and the metabolic rate and the heart rate will go back to a normal level. And then you've got the reverse when the thyroxine concentration is lower than normal. So here the metabolic rate and the heart rate is lower than normal and this stimulates the hypothalamus to secrete 
more TRH. And then because it's more TRH, it targets the pituitary gland to secrete more TSH. And more TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxine. And this increases the thyroxine concentration back to normal, which will increase the metabolic rate and the heart rate back to normal. So that is how negative feedback works involving those free endocrine glands and the free hormones so that thyroxine has an effect on the metabolic rate and the heart rate. So just recap, you've got thyroxine at normal level. If there's an increase in thyroxine concentration, that inhibits TRH released by the hypothalamus, which inhibits TSH production by the pituitary gland, which inhibits thyroxine production by the thyroid gland. And this decreases the amount of thyroxine back to normal level. And if there's a decrease in thyroxine concentration, it stimulates the hypothalamus to secrete more TRH, which stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more TSH, which stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxine. And that increases the amount of thyroxine. And here is a four mark question on the negative feedback on thyroxine. And notice that in the spec, they use the word negative feedback for thyroxine and not some of the other topics that I'm going to discuss, which you can be asked about as well. So when the concentration of thyroxine in the blood is too low, this stimulates a corrective mechanism where the hypothalamus secretes more TRH, which causes the pituitary gland to secrete more TSH. And that stimulates the thyroxine gland to produce more thyroid, uh, sorry, the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxine. And if the thyroxine concentration is too high, then TRH production is inhibited by the hypothalamus and less thyroxine is produced. And here's a um, additional summary. How does your body prepare for fight or flight? Tyrone? Are you going trick or treating? No, probably. <laughs> Okay, so you can see in that example when the person was suddenly uh, shocked, he reacted very fast. So that means he had to move very quickly using his muscles. So for fight or flight response, we need to know the hormone, the endocrine gland and the target organs. So the hormone is adrenaline and you can see that he had a lot of adrenaline which is produced by the adrenal glands and it has an effect on the heart, the blood vessels and the liver and when it has those effect it causes an increase in the heart rate and it also causes an increase in blood pressure blood flow to muscles and blood glucose concentration so how does it increase the heart rate adrenaline stimulates the heart muscle cells to contract more rapidly and this causes the heart rate to increase it also causes an increase in the blood pressure and this is because adrenaline stimulates the heart muscle cells to contract more strongly. Now we know that blood pressure is when blood collides with the surface of the artery wall. So an increase in blood pressure is when there's more collisions with the artery wall. And this is, happens because the heart contracts more strongly and that is why when the heart muscle cells contract more strongly, there's an increase in blood pressure and adrenaline has that effect on the heart muscle cells. Another effect adrenaline has is it causes an increase in blood flow to muscles. And the reason or the way it does that is because you'll notice here that the blood vessels leading to the muscles widen. And because they're widened, that means more blood could flow to the muscles. And then another effect adrenaline has is it increases the blood sugar concentration. And this is because it could cause changes in the liver and stimulate the liver to break down glycogen into glucose. And when it breaks down glycogen to glucose, the glucose is released into the blood and that increases the blood sugar concentration. 
Now that is a very similar effect to another hormone called glucagon which I will discuss later on but it does exactly the same thing. So here the endocrine gland is the adrenal gland, the hormone secreted is adrenaline, it's transported by the blood to the liver and it increases blood glucose concentration by breaking down stored glycogen into glucose. So you can see here that the liver has got stored glycogen and the example here I'm using glucagon as a hormone but adrenaline does exactly the same thing. It causes the liver or it stimulates the liver to break down glycogen and when it breaks down glycogen into glucose the glucose is released into the bloodstream and that increases the amount of glucose. So adrenaline has the same effect as glucagon where it stimulates the liver to break down stored glycogen into glucose and the glucose concentration then increases. So using the spec, explain how adrenaline produced by the adrenal glands prepares the body for fight or flight response. Effectively, what adrenaline does is it increases the heart rate, blood pressure, blood flow to muscles and blood glucose concentration. And this means it provides muscle cells with more glucose and oxygen. And because muscle cells get more glucose and oxygen, that means that they can increase the amount of respiration it does. Therefore, more energy is released. And with more energy release, they can contract more quickly and therefore rapid activity could happen much faster. And this means the person can respond whether they're doing fight or flight, they can move quicker and they react quicker as well. And that's because the muscle cells do more respiration, release more energy because they're supplied by, they're supplied more glucose and oxygen due to the increasing heart rate, blood pressure, blood flow to muscles and blood glucose concentration. The menstrual cycle is a cycle of changes in a female's reproductive system and the whole point of those changes happening is to prepare a female's body uh, in case an egg has been fertilized. And we know from SB1 that the cytoplasm is packed with nutrients and that supplies a fertilized egg cell with energy for growth and development. And when the egg has been fertilized, it turns into a zygote, and then that zygote, through cell division or mitosis, uh, changes into an embryo. However, eventually it runs out of nutrients to develop into a fetus, so it has to get its nutrients from somewhere else. So this is where the changes in the female's reproductive system occur, so that nutrients are available for a fer um, an embryo. And you can see here the embryo implanting itself on the lining of the uterus and that is where nutrients are supplied for the embryo to grow into the fetus. But the problem is the lining of the uterus loses the ability to provide nutrients before implantation unless it breaks down every 28 days roughly. So if it doesn't break down unfortunately it will not be able to provide nutrients in case an embryo implants itself. So the only way you could make sure that it maintains the supply of nutrients before implantation can happen is if it breaks down every 28 days and this is known as menstruation. So you can see at the beginning here the menstrual cycle starts with menstruation which is also known as period and that menstruation period is when the lining of the uterus breaks down and then the next stage is the lining of the uterus you can see is rebuilding is thickening again and then after an egg has been released the lining of the uterus in terms of its thickening is being maintained and then if an egg hasn't been fertilized it then breaks down again and the menstrual cycle restarts So explain how hormones interact to control the menstrual cycle. There are four hormones you need to know about. So you can remember them using the acronym FOLP, which is the order of how these hormones have an effect on the menstrual cycle. So F stands for FSH, which is a follicle stimulating hormone. O is for estrogen. L is for LH, which is a luteinizing hormone. And then P is for progesterone. And we should know which endocrine glands these hormones are secreted uh, by. So we know that the pituitary gland secretes 
FSH and LH and the ovaries secrete estrogen and progesterone. So the menstrual cycle is controlled by sex hormones and there are two sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone and they're released by the ovaries. So these are the ovarian hormones. And you can see when the estrogen concentration increases, it has an effect on the lining of the uterus. It causes the uterus wall to thicken. An increase in progesterone causes the lining of the uterus thickness to be maintained. And you can see that when the progesterone concentration decreases, it's no longer maintaining the thickness of the uterus lining, and that uterus lining breaks down, which is known as menstruation. So the changes in these hormone concentration in the blood causes changes in the thickness of the uterus wall during the menstrual cycle. So these two hormones, the ovarian sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, their effect is on the thickness of the uterus wall. So here we've got the order of the hormones using the acronym FOLP and as we said estrogen causes the thickening of the lining of the uterus and progesterone maintains that lining thickness. And the other two hormones are FSH and LH and they're the pituitary hormones so they're secreted by the pituitary gland and both of those hormones have an effect on the egg follicle. So you can see here an increase in FSH causes an egg follicle to mature whereas an increase in LH causes ovulation which is the release of an egg from the ovaries. So the pituitary hormones have an effect on the egg follicle whereas the ovarian hormones have an effect on the thickness of the lining of the uterus. In an exam question, if you're asked about the effect of these hormones, you should talk about the effect on the egg follicle or the lining of the uterus first before mentioning how they affect each other's concentration. So the primary function should be about their effect on the changes in the female reproductive organ and then you could talk about how they affect each other. So you've got to know how these hormones affect the secretion of each other as well. So again, you've got to remember the acronym FOLP because that is the order of how the hormones affect each other. So first we've got FSH and we said the primary function is to cause an egg follicle to mature. And when the egg follicle matures, it releases more estrogen and that increases the estrogen concentration. And then estrogen's primary function is to thicken the lining of the uterus to rebuild it back to uh, a larger level and it also causes an increase in LH. An increase in LH causes ovulation where an egg is released from the ovaries. An increase in LH also causes the remaining follicles to convert to corpus luteum and that's why LH is known as a luteinizing hormone. The, lut the corpus luteum um, secretes progesterone and increase in progesterone, as we said earlier, maintains the thickness of the uterus lining. However, here the progesterone inhibits FSH and LH. So this is a good example of negative feedback. Now if an egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum breaks down and because it breaks down, Remember, its function is to secrete progesterone. So breaking down means that the progesterone concentration will decrease. And as we said, a function of progesterone is to maintain the thickness of the lining of the uterus. So decrease in progesterone causes the uterus lining thickness to decrease and break down. And so that's known as a menstrual period or menstruation. And then the other function we said of progesterone is to inhibit FSH and LH. So if the progesterone concentration decreases, you notice that FSH and LH concentration are no longer inhibited, so they increase. And when FSH increases, we're back to the beginning of the menstrual cycle where there's an increase in FSH. 
and that is why FSH increased at the beginning of the cycle is because it was no longer inhibited by progesterone from the previous menstrual cycle. So a quick recap of the menstrual cycle and how it's controlled by these four hormones. So remember the acronym FOLP is this the order. So the first hormone effect is FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. And as we said, the follicle stimulated hormone is released by the pituitary gland. And when it's secreted by the pituitary gland and increases in concentration because it's no longer inhibited by progesterone, it causes an egg follicle to mature. And that maturing egg follicle stimulates estrogen production. And then using the acronym FOLT, we know estrogen is next. So an increase in estrogen secretion by the ovaries. And we know it's because it's being secreted by the matured egg follicle. Causes the lining of the uterus to thicken. And when the lining of the uterus thickens and grows, it also stimulates an increase in LH. An increase in LH, which is the luteinizing hormone, which is the next hormone using our acronym FOLP. It's released by the pituitary gland and it stimulates ovulation, which is the release of an egg from the ovary. And it also stimulates the remaining follicle to develop into corpus luteum and that secretes progesterone. So the progesterone concentration increases due to LH. So that's our last hormone we discussed, progesterone. And progesterone is uh, secreted by the corpus luteum in the ovaries after ovulation. And its function is to maintain the lining of the uterus in terms of the thickness. And it also inhibits uh, FSH and LH. And obviously the corpus luteum then breaks down and this causes a decrease in progesterone and since its function is to maintain the uterus lining thickness, a decrease in progesterone concentration will cause the uh, thickness of the uterus lining to decrease because it will break down and that causes um, menstruation. And then the other thing progesterone did is inhibited FSH and LH. So a decrease in progesterone concentration means that the FSH concentration could increase again to start the menstrual cycle. Now for fertilized egg implants in the uterus, and that's when a uh, pregnancy occurs due to implantation, then the level of progesterone remains high. So the progesterone concentration doesn't decrease. And this maintains the lining of the uterus in terms of its thickness. So therefore there's no decrease in progesterone and there's that the FSH continues to be inhibited. And because there's no decrease in progesterone that means the thickness of the uterus lining remains and because it's been maintained therefore there's no menstruation and that is a sign of pregnancy because there will be no menstruation so that means a missed period is a sign that pregnancy has occurred. And here's a six mark question explaining how FSH, LH, estrogen, progesterone interact to control the menstrual cycle. So an example here, you should remember to use the acronym FOLP and talk about each hormone in order and how they have an effect on their primary function on the egg follicle and the lining of the uterus and then how they affect each other's concentration as well. Then your exam, you could also be asked three or four mark questions talking about how these hormones interact for ovulation and menstruation to occur. So this is where they're asking a question on half of the menstrual cycle. So if you're talking about ovulation, it's from the beginning of the menstrual cycle to the release of an egg. And then the effect on menstruation, you're talking about uh, the, the decrease in progesterone and that, how that leads to the lining of the uterus thickness to break down. So using this summary where we've got the functions of all the hormones, we know that FSH secreted by uh, the, we should say, uh, pituitary gland and its target organ is the egg follicle in the ovaries and its effect is to mature egg follicle which stimulates estrogen production. 
and estrogen is secreted by follicles in the ovaries. Its target organ is the uterus lining and the pituitary gland and causes the thickening lining of the uterus and stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more LH. And then LH is not secreted by the adrenal gland, I should say, it's secreted by the pituitary gland and its target organ is the egg follicle in the ovaries and it causes ovulation which is the release of an egg and progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum in the ovaries it has an effect on the uterus lining and it maintains the thickness of the uterus lining okay if a sperm cell meets an egg cell fertilization can occur so you can see here in this example that after ejaculation we've got the sperm it's moving towards an egg and then fertilization is when the nucleus of both of those gametes fuse together so you can see that happening here okay so to prevent fertilization is known as contraception and there are two contraception methods you need to know about. There's physical barriers, which is things like using a condom, and that prevents a sperm and an egg uh, being fertilized. And then there are also using hormones, so there are hormonal contraception as well. We know that after ovulation, the corpus luteum forms from the remaining egg follicle, and this increases the progesterone concentration which maintains the thickness of the uterus lining. If the egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum breaks down, the progesterone concentration decreases, and the uterus lining thickness breaks down and menstruation occurs. However, if an egg is fertilized, then the corpus luteum doesn't break down, progesterone concentration remains high, and the lining of the uterus thickness also remains and is maintained. And during pregnancy, both estrogen and progesterone levels remain high because the corpus luteum doesn't break down. And remember, their function is also to inhibit FSH and LH. And if you inhibit FSH and LH, inhibiting FSH means that an egg follicle can't be matured, and inhibiting LH means that an egg can't be released, so ovulation can't occur. So, looking at those two examples, you could actually see that in pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone levels remain high and it inhibits FSH and LH, and this prevents the maturity and release of another egg. And this is why, if you're pregnant, you can't, be, you can't get pregnant again at the same time. And then scientists use that information. They understand that if the female's body does this, uh, naturally then we can mimic that using a pill that contains progesterone and give it to females who don't want to get pregnant so the progesterone is given to females and that progesterone inhibits FSH and LH and because it inhibits FSH and LH in the uh, using the pill that means an egg follicle can't mature will be released and that prevents pregnancy which is known as contraception so that is a hormonal method of contraception where you use progesterone hormones in a pill that prevents ovulation. Another uh, use of progesterone hormones is the fact that it thickens the mucus at the cervix and because it does that it makes it difficult for sperm cells to pass through. So here you can see the effect of progesterone is to thicken the cervical mucus and because it thickens the cervical mucus it makes it harder for the sperm cells to go through that uh, mucus and if it goes makes it harder for it to go through the mucus that means it's very difficult for them to reach the egg to fertilize it and that's another method of contraception in an exam question if you have to talk about the advantage and disadvantage of using hormonal contraceptions remember hormonal contraceptions are more effective than uh, any form of physical barriers however they don't protect against um, STDs. Now some couples want to increase the chance of pregnancy so they don't want to use contraception they want to actually get pregnant 
and this could be overcome using assisted reproductive technology and there's two different types of uh, ART that you need to know about you need to know about clomiphene therapy and clomiphene therapy is when you take a drug and that drug helps to increase the concentration of FSH and LH in the blood so you're not actually taking FSH and LH you're taking a drug and that drug will then cause the female to produce more FSH and LH uh, stimulates the pituitary gland to release more of those hormones and if that increases the amount of FSH and LH that means an egg follicle can be matured and an egg can be released so it increases the chance of those happening and that's because a clomiphene drug is being taken which is a form of art and then another example of art technique is IVF which is uh, in vitro fertilization so this fertilization outside of the female reproductive organ and here first of all you got to mature an egg follicle and you could do that by giving a female FSH and this will cause um, egg follicles to mature and then you want to get some of these um, egg follicles so what you do is you need them to be released and that means providing the female with LH and then you take the egg follicle or egg cells out and you have to also get some sperm you fuse the nucleus together and therefore fertilization happens and then the fertilized egg can do cell division by mitosis and grow into an embryo and then that embryo is implanted on the lining of the uterus in a female and that could be thickened by providing progesterone Now, glucose is a type of sugar used by the body to release energy and respiration. Um, there are two different ways where the level of blood glucose concentration could be affected. You could eat, which will cause your blood glucose concentration to increase, and you could also exercise, which will decrease your blood glucose concentration. So how does the body regulate blood glucose concentration? So this involves the endocrine gland pancreas which secretes both insulin and glucagon so in this example the blood glucose concentration increases say after eating this stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin and that will decrease the blood glucose concentration whereas the reverse if there's a decrease in blood glucose concentration because you've been using the glucose to uh, in respiration to release energy when you're exercising that will stimulate the pancreas to secrete another hormone called glucagon. So the pancreas can secrete insulin or glucagon depending on the concentration of the glucose in the blood. And the effect of secreting glucagon is that there's an increase in blood glucose concentration back to a normal level. So how do both of these hormones help keep blood glucose concentration within safe limits? So here you can see an example after eating the blood glucose concentration increases you can see that here there's an increase in uh, glucose in the blood and that stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin you can see the insulin is traveling through the blood which is what hormones do until it reaches its target organ and the target organ is the liver and insulin stimulates the liver to take up the glucose and convert it into glycogen which it then stores and because it's taken up the glucose the glucose concentration in the blood will decrease and notice it's not insulin that's converting the glucose into glycogen it's the liver so insulin is the messenger the chemical messenger which stimulates the liver to take up glucose and convert it into stored glycogen okay and then we've got the reverse when you're exercising so when exercise happens the glucose concentration in the blood decreases and that's because obviously the glucose is being used by muscle cells to release energy uh, through respiration and you can see there's a lack of glucose in the blood so one way to increase it is the pancreas endocrine gland secretes a hormone called glucagon 
and when it's a crisp glucagon travels through the blood until it reaches its target organ the liver remember the liver contains stored glycogen so the message it sends to the liver is to break down the stored glycogen into glucose and release it into the blood and this increases the blood glucose concentration So to recap, insulin is released when the blood glucose concentration is high, in other words there's uh, an excess amount of glucose in the blood and the liver stores the excess glucose as glycogen. Whereas glucagon is released by the pancreas when blood glucose concentration is low and this is where the liver breaks down stored glycogen to glucose and releases it into the blood to increase the blood glucose concentration. An exam tip. When you're talking about glucose, make sure you talk about the blood glucose concentration. Use the word blood glucose to get additional marks. And you want to also mention that it's the excess glucose that is converted to glycan, not all of it. So blood glucose concentration at a normal level, when it increases due to eating, it stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin, which transports by blood to target organ liver, and the liver then converts excess glucose into glycogen which decreases blood glucose concentration and the blood glucose concentration decreases say after exercising it stimulates the pancreas to secrete glucagon which transports by blood to target organ liver and the liver breaks down the stored glycogen into glucose that is released into the blood and this increases the blood glucose concentration And here's an exam question with answer where you can compare the roles of glucagon and insulin and explain why blood glucose concentration is an example of negative feedback, which we said is a response system that triggers changes to bring a, a level back to normal. When you maintain a constant internal environment, in other words, keeping uh, something at a constant level, this is known as homeostasis. And it's really important to maintain the glucose concentration in the blood at a certain level because a very high blood glucose concentration is dangerous because it can damage organs. So you can see examples of organs that can damage there. It tends to be related to blood vessels leading to certain organs such as the eye, uh, the kidney or even the heart. So this is what you need to know from the spec. You need to explain the importance of maintaining a constant internal environment response to internal external exchanges and obviously the maintaining it is known as homeostasis and then you've got to explain the importance of homeostasis not only in glucose regulation which is maintaining the blood glucose concentration but also in thermoregulation and osmoregulation which are topics I'm about to discuss. A person who can't control blood glucose concentration has diabetes and there are two different types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is when the immune system destroys the pancreas cells that make insulin and because these pancreas cells are destroyed that means the pancreas doesn't make any insulin and therefore you can't control the rising blood glucose concentration and then a high blood glucose concentration can be detected in the urine and that is a sign that someone has got diabetes so you can see from the picture there is glucose uh, in the blood but there's no insulin and that's because the pancreas that produces insulin has been destroyed by the person's own immune system and that's causing type 1 diabetes and to control it a person can inject insulin since they can't produce their own insulin they'll inject insulin based on the amount of blood glucose concentration which they detect and then they inject a certain amount of insulin based on how high the glucose concentration is in the blood a type 2 diabetes you can see there is insulin in the, in the blood here However, the liver and also the muscle cells become resistant and therefore they don't respond to insulin. So the key word there you want to use is resistant and respond. And you want to say that they don't respond to insulin. So here a person can make um, insulin, the pancreas can secrete it, but unfortunately uh, the liver and also the muscle cells become resistant and don't respond to it. So how can you control it? If you do produce insulin but your target organs don't respond 
therefore you have to be careful about how much glucose you consume so you control how much sugar you eat by making sure you have a low sugar diet which means that your blood glucose concentration never increases too high and the other thing you can do is exercise regularly because this will remove the glucose from the blood because you'll be using the glucose to release energy f by respiration so that you use it when you're exercising. So those are two different methods of controlling uh, diabetes. Now you notice here that people who are obese are more likely to have type 2 diabetes. So therefore we could say that there is a correlation between uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. And therefore someone who is more fat in their body is more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. So we want to know who is at risk of developing type 2 diabetes and we can see a trend that as the years have increased the number of people with type 2 diabetes has also increased. So it's really important to find out who's at risk. So if you want to find out who's got more fat you could estimate the amount of fat using BMI which we discussed previously in SB5. Remember BMI is mass divided by height squared and so we've seen these examples before. So there's a correlation between BMI and type 2 diabetes. So therefore, if you decrease your mass, you could decrease BMI, and that decreases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Of course, if someone increases their mass, they're going to increase their BMI, and therefore increase the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So if you want to reduce your risk of getting type 2 diabetes, then you should decrease your mass. An alternative method to BMI is waist to hip ratio and that also correlates with the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So as we've seen in this example in SP5 before, to calculate waist to hip ratio is just waist divided by hip. And again, uh, the higher the waist to hip ratio, the higher the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The core body temperature of a human body is 37 degrees Celsius. So if your core body temperature is too high or too low, then there are uh, effects that happen. So for instance, if the body temperature is below 37 degrees Celsius, so it reaches around 34, that means that the core body temperature has decreased and you could get hypothermia. However, if your body temperature increases above 37 degrees Celsius, then you could get hyperthermia which is also known as a fever. Now this is important because temperature could affect enzymes in the body. So we've got a core body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius and if your core body temperature decreases you get hyperthermia and this could cause a decrease in enzyme activity in the cells and therefore uh, reactions happen more slower in the body Whereas if the core body temperature increases above 37 degrees Celsius, it could lead to hypothermia. And here the enzymes in the body cells will denature and therefore that will also lead to a decrease in enzyme activity, which is not good for body cells. So to control the body temperature is known as thermoregulation and that keeps the temperature or the core body temperature around 37 degrees Celsius. And using the spec, you've got to be able to explain the importance of thermoregulation. So we know that thermoregulation uh, keeps the core body temperature around 37 degrees Celsius, which is the optimum temperature for enzyme activity to occur. And if the core body temperature decreases or increases, in other words, you are hypothermia or hyperthermia, therefore the enzyme activity will decrease and these body cells will not function at their best because the enzymes will either, in terms of their rate of reaction, will be lower or they will be denatured. So how could you detect and monitor the temperature in the body so that you could maintain it at a constant 37 degrees Celsius? Well, the temperature is monitored by the hypothalamus and it receives information from temperature receptors. And there's two different methods it can receive information about how the temperature is either increase or decrease. And we know that temperature receptors are found in sense organs from previous units, so you could actually find them in the skin. 
and from the spec you need to know that it's from the dermis of the skin and that will help uh, detect any change in external temperature and transmit that information to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus could also uh, find out any change in uh, the core body temperature through the blood. So this is an internal change in uh, temperature. So external differences in temperature through the dermis of the skin and internal through the blood and that information can be transmitted to the hypothalamus which monitors it. And the core body temperature increases so it goes above 37 degrees Celsius as I said it's detected by the hypothalamus and therefore it has to trigger a change to decrease the core body temperature and this is done by uh, increasing the amount of heat energy lost in the environment. So if the core body temperature increases you want to lose more heat energy. However if there is a decrease in core body temperature you want to detect it by the hypothalamus and that will trigger changes that decrease the heat energy loss. In other words you want to stop heat energy from being lost to the environment if your core body temperature decreases. You can also find ways to gain more heat energy. So what are the different methods that they occur? There are five different methods that you need to know about for your exam. So you can see in the top example we've got shivering and shivering involves muscle and respiration so here the muscles contract rapidly and because they contract rapidly that requires energy released from respiration which is an exothermic reaction and some of that energy from respiration is not only used to make the muscles contract rapidly but some of it is released as heat energy which warms the body. So one way of increasing the core body temperature is to shiver and that is because muscles contract rapidly and some of that energy released from respiration warms the body up. Another method when you're too cold you can see here we've got goosebumps on the skin and this involves muscles as well and these muscles are called erector muscles and these erector muscles are found on the skin dermis where they contract and when they contract they cause the body hairs to stand upright and because the body here stand upright it traps air and that air acts as an insulator and reduces the heat energy lost to the environment. So you can see when it's cold because of the trapped air due to body hair standing upright the heat energy lost to the environment decreases whereas when it's hot environment the body hairs are not trapped there's no air um, trapped as an insulator and therefore heat energy can be lost to the environment. When it's cold you could sweat and sweating occurs the sweat is released from a sweat gland and it's released onto the skin epidermis and then when the sweat evaporates it transfers heat energy from the skin to the environment and that cools the body. So here's a summary of those three different methods and then you've got an additional high level method for the exam of what happens when it's too cold or too hot and this involves the blood vessels so this is vasoconstriction and vasodilation and in vasoconstriction when the body is too cold the small blood vessels in the skin uh, constrict and so less blood flows through them reducing heat loss whereas in vasodilation when the body is too hot, small blood vessels in the skin dilate and so blood flow increases bringing more blood to the surface where it loses heat energy. And we can see the difference between both of them. So here you could identify in both vasoconstriction and vasodilution there's a difference in the um, widening or the narrowing of the blood vessels that are on the skin surface. In vasoconstriction those blood vessels constrict and become narrow. In vasodilation uh, they widen and dilate and this has an effect on how much blood could flow closer to the skin surface. And if there's less blood flowing closer to the skin surface that means less heat energy is lost to the environment. If there's more blood flowing closer to the skin surface that means more heat energy can be lost to the environment by radiation. 
So to summarize that, in vasoconstriction, skin blood vessels constrict and narrow, and this decreases blood flow close to the skin surface, and this decreases heat energy lost by radiation from the blood to the environment, which keeps the body warm. Whereas in vasodilation, the skin blood vessels dilate and widen. This increases the blood flow close to the skin surface, and this increases heat energy lost by radiation from the blood to the environment. And because you're losing more heat energy, therefore you're cooling the body down. And you can notice this because when you're feeling really hot, you might notice that your face is a lot more redder. And this is because the more blood is closer to the skin surface, making your face red. And that is because you want to lose more heat energy by radiation from the blood to the environment. If you're feeling cold, your skin might be a lot more paler. And that's because there's less blood flowing close to the skin surface. So using the spec, this is what you need to know. You need to explain how thermoregulation takes place in terms of the function of the skin, including the role of the dermis, the epidermis, and the hypothalamus. And then you've got to explain how thermoregulation takes place, referencing shivering, vasoconstriction, and dilation. And notice, in terms of the function of the skin, we know the role of the dermis is that it has temperature receptors that can transmit impulses to the uh, hypothalamus to tell the hypothalamus any change in the um, external temperature and then there are other examples here so in the skin dermis you've also got erector muscles and that's got to do with them contracting so that it could um, trap air as an insulator you've also got uh, skin being involved because there are blood vessels in the skin that affect uh, how much blood flows close to the skin or away from the skin and that's in vasoconstriction and dilation and then you've got skin epidermis where sweat is released over it and that's got to do with uh, the sweat evaporating so you can see the role of skin is quite important in um, thermoregulation and we can see that example here. So when the temperature um, increases, you can see that sweat is produced by the sweat glands onto the skin epidermis and evaporates, which uh, means that heat is lost to the environment. And you can also see that the blood vessels are more wider and they've dilated, that means more, more blood flowing close to the skin surface. And then you can see the difference when someone is feeling cold. Their hairs are upright now due to the erector muscles contracting. That traps air as an insulator. You'll also have noticed that the blood vessels have narrowed and constricted. So there's less blood flowing close to the skin surface. And therefore less uh, heat energy lost by radiation to the environment. So here's a six mark question. Explain how the human body responds to external temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. So here you can see the temperature outside is higher than the core body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So you're gonna find ways of decreasing the um, core body temperature. And these are the response. And then we're moving on to our last topic, which is osmoregulation. And this is where you have to control uh, the amount of water in the body. And this is important because it affects how much water cells take in by osmosis. If there's a lot of water in the body, cells will take in more water by osmosis. And this could cause a cell to lice and burst. However, we know that water is also important in maintaining the shape of the cell. So it's important to have the correct level of water um, if there's not enough water in the body, then cells could also shrink. And that's important because water is also needed for chemical reactions to occur in the cells. Um, so the function of water is very important in cells. So we need to regulate and make sure that we maintain a constant level of water. And this involves the urinary system, which is function is to remove excess amounts of sub substances. It removes that excess amount from the blood 
which includes water, but could also include mineral salts in terms of excess amounts. It could also remove waste products such as urea. Remember, urea is produced in the liver from the breakdown of excess amino acids. And when it passes into the blood, it's carried to the kidney, which is where the urinary system uh, has an effect. So first we've got blood that enters the kidney. And when it enters the kidney, it enters through the renal arteries. And using the spec, you've got to be able to describe the structure of the urinary system. So the first structure is the renal arteries carries blood uh, to the kidneys. The kidney then removes substances from the blood to make the urine, so it removes the waste product. And then the urine is stored in the bladder. And to reach the bladder, it has to travel through the ureter. And then to get rid of the urine out of the body, it travels through the urethra. So you've got to make sure you know the difference between ureter and urethra. Ureter is um, how the urine is carried from the kidneys to the bladder, whereas the urethra is how the urine is removed from outside the body. And then the blood that is uh, moving out of the kidney goes out through the renal veins. So here's the kidney structure. And this kidney structure has got thousands and thousands of nephrons, which is a structure where blood is filtered. So here's the spec where it says 7.19b, explain how the structure of the nephron is related to its function in filtering the blood and forming urine. So you're going to know about how this nephron helps both filtration and urine formation. So as we said earlier, blood that um, is transported to the kidney or to the nephron occurs through the renal artery and then when it enters the nephron filtration occurs and filtration occurs between the glomerus and the Bowman's capsule and in that filtration the glomerus and the Bowman's capsule has got tiny pores and these pores only filter very small molecules such as water, glucose and urea into the nephron the larger molecules can't be filtered, so they stay in the blood. So things like protein. And then that filtrate, which contains water, glucose and urea, keeps moving on until it reaches the first convoluted tubule. And notice that it's got water and glucose, which are useful substances. So we want to selectively reabsorb that back into the body. We want the water and glucose to be in the body and not uh, in the urine. So in the first convoluted tubule, you have, which is also known as proximal convoluted tubule in some books, there is selective reabsorption of glucose. The problem is the filtrate glucose concentration, in other words the glucose concentration in the first convoluted tubule, is lower than the glucose concentration in the capillary. So if you want to selectively reabsorb, you're trying to remove glucose from the filtrate from a a lower concentration to a higher concentration. So if you want to move glucose from a lower glucose concentration to a high glucose concentration, which is against the glucose concentration gradient, it's going to require energy. And because it requires energy, that means that the first convoluted tubule, those cells in the lining, have got lots of mitochondria. Because they have lots of mitochondria, it could release energy by respiration that could be used for active transport of glucose against the concentration gradient. So this is one adaptation that these first convoluted tubules have. And then the filtrate keeps moving. So remember now all the glucose has been removed from it, but there's still useful substances such as water. And water is removed in the collecting duct, where reabsorption of water occurs. And the amount of reabsorption water occurs depends on how much water there is in the blood. And that reabsorption water occurs in the collecting duct because there are tiny pores there which makes it permeable for water to move out of the filtrate by osmosis. And then that creates urine which uh, goes to the ureter which we discussed earlier. The ureter carries the urine from the kidney to the bladder, which stores the urine, and then that leaves the body through the urethra. 
So here the nephron structure is the function adaptation. As we mentioned, the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule is where blood is filtered, and that's because there are tiny pores that only filter very small molecules, such as water, glucose, and urea, into the nephron. And then you've got the first convoluted tubule, where selective reabsorption of glucose happens by active transport from a low glucose concentration to a high glucose concentration from the nephron to the capillary. And one of the adaptation is they've got lots of mitochondria to release energy by respiration for active transport. There are other adaptations as well that they have. Obviously, they've got um, uh, carrier proteins or transport proteins. They've also got a large surface area to increase the amount of selective reabsorption that happens. And then you've got the collecting duct where reabsorption of water by osmosis back into the blood occurs. And that's because the collecting duct is permeable to water. So it's got pores that allow the water to move by osmosis. So again, uh, the amount of water in terms of how it's controlled in the body involves negative feedback. If the blood water concentration increases, that's detected by the hypothalamus and that triggers changes to decrease the blood water concentration. Whereas if the blood water concentration decreases, again, detected by the hypothalamus, and that means you want to make changes to increase the concentration of water in the, in the blood. So we're going to know which endocrine gland and hormone is involved in the negative feedback corrector mechanism of blood water concentration. So here is the pituitary gland, which secretes a hormone called ADH, otherwise known as antidiuretic hormone. And that hormone is released by the pituitary gland directly into the blood. And what it does is it causes the walls of the collecting duct to become more permeable. And because it's more permeable, that means more water can be reabsorbed back into the blood. Remember, this is all controlled and detected by the hypothalamus, which detects how watery the blood is. So when the blood water concentration increases, detected by the hypothalamus, it stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete less ADH. So this is when there's too much water in the blood, detected by the hypothalamus, less ADH is secreted by a pituitary gland and that means the collecting duct is going to be less permeable so less water is reabsorbed back into the blood so in other words more of it stays in the urine and because more of it stays in the urine the urine is going to have a larger volume and it's going to be more dilute so having too much water in the blood means that you secrete less ADH such that the collecting duct is less permeable and less water is reabsorbed back into the blood more of it stays in the nephron and uh, more of it then goes into the urine. And then you got the opposite. When there's not a lot of water in the blood, again detected by the hypothalamus, but this time it will stimulate the pituitary gland to secrete more ADH. Uh, when it secretes more ADH, the collecting duct will become more permeable Therefore, more water is reabsorbed back into the blood. And this is because you don't have a lot of water in the blood in the first place. And that increases the um, water in the blood, which means it's going to be less water in the urine. So the urine becomes more concentrated and there's a smaller volume of urine produced. So here's a summary where you can see in the middle how the collecting duct permeability changes. If there's more ADH, the collecting duct becomes more permeable so there's more reabsorption of water by osmosis, whereas if there's um, no ADH secreted by the pituitary gland, the collecting duct is not permeable to water, so less water is reabsorbed uh, back into the blood. Now to finish off, we're gonna know how kidney failure could be treated, and there's two different methods. You can use dialysis, which has to be carried out every couple of days in a hospital. And the whole point of dialysis is it removes waste such as urea, which could harm cell processes in the body, such as reactions. So if too much of it is produced, it becomes toxic and it has an effect on reactions in the cell. And so you can remove it every couple of days during dialysis as an alternative to a kidney that is failing. And this works because the dialysis tubing is partially permeable. And because it's partially permeable, you can put dialysis fluid through the dialysis machine around the dialysis tubing and this dialysis fluid has to contain the same concentration of useless substances such as glucose and minerals 
so that glucose and minerals are not diffusing out of the blood. Because it's the same concentration, the net diffusion will be zero. So it's really important that the diastolic fluid contains the same concentration of glucose and mineral ions as it does in the blood. So there's, there's no removal of those useful substances out of the blood by diffusion. However, you do want the diastolic fluid to contain no urea and then this causes urea to diffuse out of the blood into the fluid by diffusion because there's a higher concentration of urea in the blood and there's a lower concentration of urea in the diastolic fluid and therefore urea diffuses out and when it does that realistically because of diffusion you're restoring the normal concentration of dissolved substance in the blood you're removing the urea but you're keeping the amount of glucose and useful minerals the same and then the diastolic fluid is removed out of the machine which should now contain the urea which is remember excess amino acids broken down by the liver a more long-term approach to uh, treating kidney failure is to do a kidney transplant and the problem with kidney transplant is because kidneys have got just like all cells have got antigens on their surface and if the antigen on the surface of the kidney cells is not, not the same as what's being transplanted so the transplanted kidney and also your own kidney has to have the same uh, type of antigens otherwise because they're not match they could be rejected because your own immune system will attack it because it will think it's foreign now because your uh, immune system attacks it uh, you must make sure it matches the same so you must have uh, the transplanted kidney must have the same antigens so it matches so that it can be accepted one of the problems with kidney transplant is also after you've done the transplant by having a matched tissue so there's no rejection because of the fact that the antigens on the surface of the kidney cells that's been transplanted is the same as the patient's uh, failed kidneys antigen one of the problems is that the patient must be treated for life with drugs and the way to do that is to um, suppress the immune system so that immune system is not attacking the transplanted uh, kidney and the problem is if you suppress the immune system that increases your chance of getting infections because you're suppressing uh, the effect of attacking any pathogens that try to cause a disease in the body so in kidney transplants there is a risk that a recipient's immune system will reject the transplant and that's because the immune system will attack the transplanted uh, organ so obviously you've got to match the tissue and that means having uh, the antigens on the surface of the uh, transplanted kidney being the same and then the person also has to take drugs to suppress the immune system so it doesn't attack the newly transplanted organ and you can do that using immunosuppressant drugs so realistically you are suppressing the immune system so that there is a lower risk of rejection but the problem with suppressing the immune system is the fact that it increases your risk of infections because by suppressing your immune system that means that you are suppressing their function which is to protect you from any um, pathogens that infect you So here's a summary of everything you need to know about um, uh, osmoregulation. So you're going to be able to describe the structure of the urinary system, explain how the structure of the nephron is related to its function in filtering the blood and forming urine, including filtration in the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, selective reabsorption of glucose and reabsorption of water. On a higher level, you're going to be able to explain the effect of ADH on the permeability of the collecting duct. And then don't forget, you also need to explain how uh, kidney failure can be treated including both kidney dialysis and organ donation and then you've got to be able to simply state that urea is produced from the breakdown of excess amino acids in the liver and then to finish off here's a recap of all the hormones um, but don't forget there is a mistake for FSH and LH where they are produced by the pituitary gland and not the adrenal gland as listed here but this is a very good summary of all the hormones you should know about